Okay, in process here. Uh, hockey tape, you know hockey tape, around the stem to keep from taking the wood lower than the level of the stem, and up here to avoid chunking up any of the wood that doesn't need to be chunked up. We're trying to get this level at the same height as the tops of the bumps, if that makes any sense. I should. Anyway, uh, take it down by hand and then we're going to texture it. Back in a minute. Okay, texture time. Uh, once you've brought the uh, the wood down to the same diameter that the stem, uh, the shank was when it was sandblasted, it's time to remove some wood and give it the same look and feel as the rest of the pipe. So there's two primary things that you that are ground rules, basics for hand carving sandblasts. And the first of those is go from the large cutters to the small cutters, medium size, and then to the small ones. Start with the big, the, the big fat guys and create just an unevenness in line. You're not creating texture as such, you're just keeping it from being a perfect tube. It looks wrong to have a heavily textured thing that hasn't morphed its shape in some way. It, your eye won't accept it, but uh, you'll, you'll start with the fat ones and move, remove just a small amount of material but enough to do the job and then move on to the middle sized ones and then on to these little tiny ones in that order and the best way I can think of to do this is not just dive in randomly and start scrabbling and scratching it's actually take a pipe out of your own rack that has a similar grain orientation to what the one you're working on meaning end grain or uh, or a uh, side grain, uh, growth rings, that kind of thing. And choose a pipe that has the same orient grain orientation as what you're trying to copy here. And then actually use it as a model, like a painter with a, a woman sitting on a stool with a flower in her teeth, or, you know, and they paint them. Do that and try to copy it as much as you can. Okay, that that's one thing. And the other is, I wouldn't dream of trying to do this without this machine. You'll notice how slow this thing goes. It's a Dremel tool, so to speak. This The brand name is Fordham here. But it'll spin fairly fast, but it'll go down to practically nothing. Very high torque. And the, they're really controllable. That's the key word. If you've got one of these like a dental drill type of things and they'll scoot and they'll slide and they'll go too deep and they'll leave burn marks and they're a pain in the butt. If you've got something like this one you're in charge the whole time and uh, if you've got aspirations to hand carving sandblast textures you're going to need something that'll go as slow as this one does. Alrighty, and there's a third tool and technique, but I'll cover that when I'm ready to actually use it. So, uh, let's see here. I'll actually start cutting on this on film a little bit. Why not? And I'll shut it off here in 30 seconds or so, but get enough to give you an idea. Okay, I'm off to uh, go get a pipe to use as a model, 
and when I come back I will have largely finished this process of running through these cutter tips. By the way, you're going to need a bunch of these. I've got a set here, another set off camera, um, a third group, where do they go? Here, and you can get these things online for shockingly little, like $20 for 20 pieces. I don't know how they can make a dime selling them that way, but they do. So uh, load up on these cutters. You never know what shapes and sizes you're going to need, and they're inexpensive. Alrighty. See you when I'm done with the cutter part, cutter step. Okay, we've taken this as far as we need to with the high-speed steel cutters. The best way to check your uh, uh, texture, as soon as you go from dark to light, it gets more difficult the, dark, the lighter it is to tell the textures. If you turn, now I've got a bunch of bright lights on in here right now for the purpose of the camera, illumination for the video camera. But if you're working alone, shut off all your lights and then use a little flashlight like that for low angle and get the shadows. I'm not going to shut everything off just to show you, but you get the idea. And it'll show you the highs and the lows and stuff. And you want to be able to uh, uh, control your texturing so that it's the same depth and texture as the bowl, for example, so you can match them without letting the dark and the light confuse your brain. Anyway, final steps, single step, multiple uh, uh, tools here. These are something I talked about in an earlier video, but they're so valuable. I'll mention them again. They're called 3M bristle discs. You want the three quarter inch ones. You put a stack of four, they're like little frisbees and you put them on these arbors in stacks and here's a a group of them they run from 120 grit to one micron meaning they polish and I use them a lot for a lot of different reasons but the single most valuable thing they do is allow you to finish uh, making a hand textured sandblast imitation and no matter how good you are with steel cutters, it'll never look quite right until you use these. At least no way I've ever found. You'll always be able to tell the difference. So here's as far as we've gotten so far. You remember I promised you how thin the, the line was going to be between the uh, two pieces of wood. And there you go. I don't know how to measure such thing. It's probably about a thousandth of an inch if you were to check it out but it's certainly going to not be visible as a line when we finish this up so anyway I'm now going to start oh yeah uh, before I continue or before I shut you off here this is a high speed guy like a dental tool this is not the same handpiece 
that I showed you a minute ago. Uh, also, not only is this low torque, high speed, but it has to be reversible. If you're right-handed, you're going to hold the tool in your right hand, and if you uh, get a conventional one that does not reverse, it's going to kick that like the snow from a tire of like a car when you're pushing the car and it shoots the snow in your face. Well, you don't want that. You want it to go counterclockwise so that the dust that's spraying off this goes the other direction, which it, otherwise you're, I don't know if you could wear a face mask or a respirator, I suppose, but otherwise you're going to get briar dust blasted straight into your nose. Uh, if you get the reversible kind, you got no such problem. And a final word, uh, it's uh, surprising to a lot of people, but here it is. The new wood on here is significantly harder than the original pipe. And whether that's age or origin, country of origin, I have no idea. But you want to keep that in mind when doing something like this, or you'll get a line. The, the, you'll be able to tell the difference in the two textures unless you're careful. You'll eat away at the softer wood faster than the harder wood, of course. So that's it. I will now finish up the texturing and uh, we'll move on to the next step. Okay, we are finished with the texturing and ready to refinish the pipe. The only part of it that I did not touch with this uh, 3M bristle disc was the nomenclature panel for obvious reasons. You uh, want to keep that as crispy as you can. The rim on this pipe was pretty crummy with uh, uh, carbon deposits, so I went ahead and buzzed it off of there. And uh, as long as we'd done the shank by necessity and this needed a little doing, I went ahead and hit the rest of the pipe lightly as well uh, just to clean it. So it's a little uneven in terms of texture, or I'm sorry, in color meaning we'll have to do uh, some areas uh, several more coats of color than the others, but it's not hard. It's just something to be aware of. One pass won't do the job here. But it's basically a brown contrast, which is uh, essentially Dunhill's shell finish, only instead of a reddish undertone, it's a brown undertone. And uh, that's fairly tricky to do and uh, it involves cutting top coats and, and stuff. In this case I will refer you to uh, the first video set I did on the uh, 6475 Dunhill because it's uh, several steps involved in doing a, a, that type of finish and I don't want to go back into it here. Uh, so there you go. Truly looking like a pipe. Oh yeah, the uh, because the uh, uh, the barling cross was gone, it gave me a a really nice opportunity to uh, level the shank to the stem without. Uh, uh, boogering something up and uh, in fact it, I was getting a kick out of doing it because I was actually leveling the shank to the stem which is like a get back at the <laughs> any of you who've re-stemmed pipes know how irritating it is it usually goes the other way around so this was back the other way but uh, other than staining the bowl and uh, cleaning up the stem and re-stamping the emblem I think we're done here but uh, I'll uh, go ahead and show you some of those steps. Uh, the, the, the complexity of restaining, again, go back to the first set of the, what do they call these things, uh, like folders. There's uh, a groups of videos in one cluster intended to be part of a, a set. I can't remember what ye, uh, YouTube calls them, but you can figure it out. It's the first, the oldest date sort by date and take the oldest one and then go through that and you'll get the uh, how to make a uh, contrast type shell finish. So anyway that's it. Uh, back in a bit. Okay. 
Okay, uh, here we go. I finished the texturing and uh, more or less refinished the pipe. I guess the, it was difficult to get the tone to match otherwise, but uh, it's still a brown two-tone. Might be a little bit darker than it was before. I might buff on it a bit more and see if I can lighten it a hair. But uh, everything turned out well. The only thing uh, left to deal with here is uh, I'm going to shine up the end of the shank a little bit. That's forgot to do that. Uh, and I've got yet to uh, make the stem shiny and nice again. And I'll uh, re-stamp it as well. Because it's a classic and oldie, I'm not going to bring it to that glass shine that some people like that I think looks odd on older pipes. I think a, a shiny but mellow glow type of thing is much more what they came from the factory with. So I'll bring it up to that. And uh, otherwise, I think it turned out well. And uh, if I... Uh, Oh yeah, I gotta uh, get the registration number, which I've got a trick for that works most of the time. And if it works, I'll let you know what it was. And that is it. Probably another half an hour total and we'll be good to go.